There was a lot to be said to getting off on the right foot. And if I could understand that better, I would have wrote a stronger opening. All right, folks, Doctor Who list time. And this one was uh, selected from a number of options made available to my Patreon supporters. And they decided this time to have me do a ranking of the first adventures of each Doctor. Now, this is going to be, I think, the first that is somewhat related to a Regenerations list. Because I've been getting asked for a while, are you going to rank the Regenerations? And one of the first things I realized was that ranking the Regenerations, in my mind, is actually a three-part job. There is ranking the actual instance of the regeneration, the specifics of why it happened and how that's pulled off. There's ranking the regeneration story as a as a thing in and of itself. And then there is ranking the first uh, full story of each new doctor. So nor if left to my own devices, that might have been the order I was doing them in. In this case, thanks to Patreon, we're doing uh, first adventures first. Yeah. So, uh, the, the, to, to lay it out and be clear, with, I think, only one exception, none of these are the episodes in which the Doctor regenerates into his newest form. This is simply the first adventure that the audience gets to see. It is not necessarily the first adventure they ever went on in the case of a couple of these, um, or maybe just in the case of one, uh, because of just sort of the nature of what was going on with the episode, but I'm still going to put it on here. And uh, I will note that the War Doctor I am not including because the first thing that we saw him in, like Complete Adventure, was Day of the Doctor, but that is so far away from his regeneration, I don't really want to count it. So uh, that means I'm going to be doing 13 of these. Let's get started. I have a suspicion most people probably know at least what the bottom two are going to be. They probably even know what number one, what the number at the very bottom is going to be. Or at least they think they do. We'll see if they're right. Number 13, Time and the Ronnie. I really did go back and forth between this one and the one that's going to occupy uh, the number 12 slot as to which one was worse. And it was not an easy call because they're both bad. But this one, to me, is the worst. Because, to my mind, a first adventure story of any given Doctor has a number of jobs to do. Um, it needs to... Tell a decent, tell a story worth telling in and of itself. It needs to give us a sense of who this doctor is so we know who we're dealing with. And it needs to establish any other major status quo changes that might be coming along with the new doctor. In some cases, that's new campaigns and whatnot. Now, that's not the case here because Mel was already in place. But this thing kind of fails on all levels because the doctor, as we get him, is. <sighs> I really like Sylvester McCoy as the Doctor, but his initial start, his first season, honestly, is not great. And you really get the feeling that they didn't know how to write for his version of the Doctor yet. And he's fun and energetic, but like in a way that that feels kind of untethered from everything else going on. Then we've got the actual story with the Ronnie and this giant stupid brain thing, and it's just dumb. It is so stupid, and the Ronnie is such an awful character in this. Like, she does this ridiculous dressing up as Mel to trick the Doctor, and it's like something out of a Saturday morning cartoon. And, you know, I say that, I know someone's going to say, this show is meant for kids. You know, you don't have to make something stupid that's meant for kids. Pixar movies are meant for kids. They're not dumb. This was dumb. And then the capper on this, what ultimately put it in the bottom place, was Mel. Just screaming after screaming after screaming. And look, I get that she can scream really well. That's actually a big part of why she got that, that, she got cast in that role. But nope, can't take anymore. So let's move it up one spot to number 12, The Twin Dilemma. Also not a good episode. I would say, honestly, possibly slightly overhated, though. Uh, that's not me defending it, because, I mean, it's my second worst. But I think what I'd say is, I feel like there's additional hate heaped on this because of, of how it 
indicated what the continuing problems of this new Doctor were going to be. Because in my mind, um, the Doctor in in the first adventure gets a little bit of a pass. It it's In my mind, it's ideal if we get right off how this Doctor works and everything. I shouldn't try snapping in these. It's, it's a weak sound. Hang on. There we go. So, um, <laughs> in my mind, it's ideal that the Doctor sort of really gives us a sense of who, of who they are, how they operate, and everything else. But I will give a certain amount of leeway to post-regeneration wonkiness if they... Uh, if the writers and, and the actor and whoever else want to play it a little bit more off kilter. I actually think that that works. And I feel like watching the twin dilemma in isolation, I was prepared to buy that this is not how the Doctor is going to be all the way through. This abrasive, this uh, unstable, this dangerous, like to the immediate people around him. Except that it was kind of how he was for the remainder of Colin Baker's time on the show. and But I feel like the knowledge that that wasn't going to get better gets heaped onto this episode. Whereas in this episode in and of itself, I don't think he's that bad. But the story is boring. Um, and the effects aren't great. It's... It's not a complete and utter disaster, which I think it gets billed as a lot, but it's just it just doesn't work. It's just boring and it's dull. And if if you um, happen to know that this doctor's not going to get better during his time on the show, then yeah, it's it's kind of rough across the board. Number eleven, Doctor Who, that being the nineteen ninety six TV movie starring. Paul McGann. This is the one instance where we have a regeneration and first adventure done in one. Um, so this, I, I mean, I, I've done a, I've done a review on this one. I actually had done a review of the last two I did as well. And I, and I noted in that review that, um, there are some highlights here. McGann himself being the big one. It's also, uh, well shot, but it, it's very, it's very undoctor who. I mean, for lack of a better way to put it, it it you can feel the American, um, you know, network's hands on the thing in terms of the way everything gets presented, the way the masters handled. Like, oh god, what a mess that performance from top to bottom. It doesn't really make any sense, and it's not consistent with anything we know about the master. And inserting all this weird stuff like. The fact that the Doctor's half-human, and then sort of constructing the plot in this very mechanical fashion. There's stuff that happens that makes absolutely no sense based off what we know of the characters, but it happens anyway because the plot requires it to. And it's, it's just not particularly effective. That said, McGann himself is good in the part. Um, you know, thank goodness Big Finish gave him the stories he deserved. And additionally, it does look quite good, which it's got over the two at the bottom. So, there you go. Next up, number 10. The Woman Who Fell to Earth. Not actually this low on the list because I think there's anything actively wrong with it. There just really wasn't much to elevate it. So, like, to compare it in the one I, to the one I just mentioned, you know, the reason that the Doctor Who TV movie is so low is because while it does have good points, it also has other things dragging those points down. This it doesn't have any massive faults, I don't feel, but it doesn't have any real severe highlights either. There are a couple of little tiny moments that are pretty good, but there's nothing that makes me go, yes, that, about this episode. And I think lacking that thing that grabs you, and it could have been anything, it could have been the companions, it could have been the doctor, it could have been the alien, could have been any number of things, but nothing, for me at least, really grabbed me about this first episode of the 13th Doctor. And as a result, despite not committing any major sins, it still ends up down here. Number nine. I'm going to get in trouble for this one. Spearhead from space. Um, yeah, I say I'm going to get in trouble for this one because, it look, it just... I don't think the Autons are that good. I, I have yet to see a particularly good story with the Autons. I would love to see one. I think the concept is interesting enough. I just don't think the Autons have been used very well. Like, at any point. Not here, not later. And the the show is um, 
it's trying very hard to, you know, to to update everything, you know, the look. And, but the thing is, I honestly am of the of, uh, am of the opinion that the leap to color hurt Doctor Who, especially visually, because black and white is really forgiving in terms of covering up uh, a lot of the seams and the wonkiness. Not all of it, trust me. There was some first and second Doctor stuff that looked really wonky, but it it can cover up quite a few sins and. I, so the, the fact that this is like, ooh, in color, I'm like, eh, I don't consider that an inherently great thing. Um, Pertwee's doing a pretty solid job in this, um, and his dynamic with the Brigadier right off, that helps quite a bit. We get um, Liz Shaw, who I like well enough, but Joe Grant is very much the definitive Third Doctor companion, and then, um, you know, Sarah Jane Smith came along later. So, it, you know, it wasn't the strongest companion um, out the gate. It's it's fine. It's like, the, the bottom three were the bad ones. Ones from here on up are going to be, at worst, fine. And that's just kind of what I feel about this one. And I know the classic Who snobs are going to tear me apart for that ranking. Next up, number eight. The Christmas Invasion. I basically can skip this until about the last 20 minutes. Basically, when the Doctor wakes up again, comes out of the TARDIS, and does that whole, did you miss me? I am on board. And I love it. Prior to that, it's... Okay. I mean, there's a lot of emphasis on the, uh, the domestic drama you know, with Jackie and with Rose, which is not an element of, uh, especially the Davies era that I particularly care for. As much as I love the character drama, the character drama that wasn't located in the TARDIS, I didn't care so much for. Overall, um, there's some really goofy stuff. The Santa robots, the killer tree. Uh, like, I don't need any of that. But once Tenet is in, I think this is one of the best of accomplishing one what I said was one of the main goals of any given uh, Doctor Who first adventure, which is to establish who this Doctor is. And right off the bat, as soon as he has the ability to start talking, just run his mouth, you immediately get, oh, you are different. But I like it. And that works really well. And that's something that's going to recur in uh, higher up entries where the prefer the initial performance was so good it elevates what otherwise was an okay story. Speaking of which, number seven, Robot. Uh, Robot was Tom Baker's first adventure and he is great. He was immediately great right off the bat. Just that big grin and, you know, a little bit weird, a little bit... Like, what's going on with this guy? And it's funny, I cannot quantify why I like it more here than in other places. But classic era Doctor Who campiness tends to not go well. For, camp, campiness in general is not something I particularly care for most of the time. And something that depends on really wonky effects rarely works for me. And, and it can drag down something that I otherwise really like. Like, the mummies in Pyramid from Mars are so laughable to me, they pull me out of this story. But there's something about Robot, which is really visually, like, what? How much money did you have to do this? And, like, just not good effects at all. I think it's just the fact that the whole notion of killer robot that at one point grows really, really big is just... I can't take that seriously on its face, so maybe that's why I'm more okay with the fact that it's not particularly well done visually, because it's not a story I would ever take seriously in the first place, so I don't feel the camp damages it. Maybe that's what's going on. I'm not gonna go so far as to say that I love the story, I'm just way more forgiving of stuff that normally bothers me in this instance than I would otherwise be. But again, what really brings it up is Tom Baker. His performance immediately is just stellar. Next up, number six, Deep Breath. So this is Peter Capaldi's first episode, and it is one that I have very mixed feelings about. But a bit like the uh, the 13th Doctor's first story, there's really nothing that is dragging it down. 
but it has more things pulling it up. Um, that for, the first being Capaldi himself. Uh, one of my favorite things about Capaldi was ultimately the journey that he went on with his characterization of the Doctor from series 8, 9 to 10. And the starting point is really well established. I adore Who Frowned Me This Face the with the attack eyebrows. Um, I love that whole thing. Uh, I love him trying to figure out who he is and deciding that the door is too boring. He's going to go out the window. I love the the just the look on his face. The 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 ambiguity of did he push that robot off the thing or not? Like I'm a little like mm, yeah, whatever. But the just something about the look, the performance. Like doing that is an ambiguous thing. I'm like, but his performance and like. Having just that hint of, oh, he looks like he could, I really like. Um, and I, I feel like it, I, I also tend to like the Victorian setting when it's not saddled with a story that completely kneecaps it. I like the Peter Noster gang, they're, so they're on hand, that helps. And uh, even though I wouldn't come to sort of, she wouldn't grow on me for really until about the end of this series, I do think that Clara has better chemistry with Capaldi than she did with Smith. So that's working better for me here than it did before too. All right, <laughs> top five. Number five, Rose. Now there's actually a few things that I don't particularly like about Rose. I mentioned already, I don't really like the Autons, um, but Eccleston is great. Literally from word one, which is just run. Nice to meet you, Rose. Run for your life. You know, all of that. I, he hooked me immediately. And I think Rose is quite endearing as well. And they have a great rapport right off the bat. And his doctor is, he just, he, a bit like with Baker's portrayal and with Tennant, once he was actually on the screen in his episode, that he conveys who this doctor is so quickly, like trying to have fun, but you can sense the damage just below the surface with him. He, it really does sell him and Rose and this entire concept because this episode had a lot to cover more than most because it didn't have to just introduce a new doctor and a new companion it had to introduce an entire new generation to doctor who who may never have even seen the classic version at all and it does all of that with an overall story that is not my favorite and with the whole thing with the nestine i'm like eh, not a huge fan but those other things are firing so well this works number four bit of a weird one this castrovalva now, the reason this is a weird one is because I mentioned usually it's really important that the that the first adventure for the Doctor establish who the Doctor is. And this one doesn't do that. Like, at all. The majority of this episode, the Doctor is completely out of sorts. Like, things are not working and clicking with him. And he's... Like, the entire plot is that he's trying to go somewhere to get himself realigned. So... This performance is in no way representative of what Davison's going to do with the part. And yet, the other elements work so well. Because I would say this is one of the best stories in Doctor Who that happens to be a first adventure story. So even setting that context aside, this is a really cool story. With what is going on with where the Doctor's going and then what is going on with when he gets there. And this has to also continue the work started in Logopolis of introducing us to Anthony Ainley's master. Now, he kind of had his first adventure with Logopolis, but we now need to get a little bit more of him. You know, what does he do when he has time to plan? And we get more of an introduction as to what he's like. And so it's pulling that duty. It's got all the companions to juggle. It's, a, it's one of the more slightly head trippy kind of uh, episodes, which I always appreciate. And even though this performance from Davison is not indicative of what his doctor will be, it is a very good performance that he he absolutely sells every step of the way. Number three, Power of the Daleks. So this is the first story for the second doctor, Patrick Troughton. Now, to be fair, I'm judging this based off the animated recreation because this is one of the 
lost stories. But that is using the original audio. It was done in a way to make it as much like what the original intention of the episode was. So I still feel fair judging it by that. And I feel like Troughton, he knew how he was playing this character, but he also knew we're going to start holding back. Because initially, this doctor starts out very quiet. And you don't know what to make of him. He's just sort of sitting there like figuring everything out. He starts playing on a pan flute. <laughs> and he's throwing everybody off the way the second doctor so often did. But doing it in a slightly more subversive way than he would tend to do later on in his run. But I think that just plays up the mystery of what regeneration even was. This was the first time it happened. Like, who is this guy? What are we dealing with now? And the way that he approaches it, instead of barreling headfirst into being his version of the Doctor and kind of easing into it with a bit more mystery, it lends a great vibe to this episode, which is already a good Dalek episode in the first place. But in addition to that, we have this, is the Doctor even going to help us? Can we trust him to help us? What kind of man is he? At the same time, we're dealing with this Dalek story, which is a pretty dang good Dalek story in and of itself. It's a great just combining of these elements, and it is terrific. Top two, and if you've been going through with a checklist, once I tell you number two, you know what number one is, but, uh, you know, we'll get there. Number two, The Eleventh Hour. The Eleventh Hour was the first story for Matt Smith, The Eleventh Doctor, and it had a lot to do. Because new doctor, new companion, new showrunner with a new approach from how Davies tended to do things, and the relationship with this companion is decidedly different from what it had been up to that point. So it's not just a matter of introducing a new character. It's introducing a new character with a new gimmick in a new way than had really been done. So covering a lot of ground. And Matt Smith nailed it right out of the gate. He embodied his take on the doctor just right, basically as soon as he starts trying the different foods, you're like, oh, I get you. But like, especially when he picks it, shows up in the bow tie, says, I am the doctor. It's like, yes, you are. So he absolutely nailed it. But Amelia Pond, also a terrific character. I still love that dynamic. I love, what I love about that is because he had kind of disappointed her and let her down when she was a kid. She's both in awe of him, but also kind of over his BS. <laughs> so it's this wonderful blend of like, she thinks he's awesome, but she is not going to let him get away with nonsense and she's going to call him out on stuff. And I love that dynamic and introducing how that happened, how it worked, giving us a little bit of a perspective on her, um, just enough without actually setting it from her POV the way that Rose was. And that gives us a companion with with a great sense of fun and who bounces off this doctor really, really well. And a doctor who, like I said, just basically showed up already fully formed, which is dang impressive in and of itself. But there was only ever going to be one number one. And that is, in fact, the number one. An unearthly child. Now, normally I consider multi-part stories as a single thing, but I really do think that An Unearthly Child, even as a single episode, is completely its own thing, separate from the, what is it, 10,000 BC or whatever the caveman story is that sort of follows after that. If you have never seen An Unearthly Child, the very first episode of Doctor Who ever aired on television, you need to, because... It is a monument to efficient storytelling in terms of, it cuts in, it's like 24 minutes. In 24 minutes, it introduces who were the primary protagonists for the show initially being Ian, or, Ian and Barbara, these school teachers. It introduces Susan, a student of theirs. It makes it clear why she's unusual, why they are curious about her, why they are concerned about her. It introduces the doctor, the nature of his relationship with Susan, the way he treats other people, how prickly he is, how bristly he is. It introduces the TARDIS and time travel. This does so much 
so efficiently while still giving us characters that feel like proper characters and aren't just delivering exposition, aren't just feeding us information. Everybody feels like a proper character from top to bottom and in a way that some of them wouldn't even equal again. Honestly, Susan is better in this than she is in almost anything else in the entire time she's on the show. She is smart and kind of mysterious and a little bit off-putting and the doctor so prickly and you he just has this this look about him like you know so much but you don't want us to know that you know so much and Ian and Barbara being endearing because of how much they care and just trying to help this child and all of it there is a reason that this show has lasted for as long as it has and none of it would have been possible without this episode and sometimes when you go back and look at the first episodes of some great shows it's not uncommon to see something that's like boy they it's a good thing they had time to develop that and make it better as time went on you know go back you know watch like the first episode of star trek the next generation it's kind of rough but you watch the first episode of this and you're like oh yeah oh yeah you can get over 50 years of stories out of this easy and that is why i think an Unearthly Child is the best first adventure of a doctor. That's my ranking of these. Uh, so, what's yours? How much do you want to rake me across the coals for putting your favorite lower than you thought it should be? Or something that you didn't like higher? Whatever your thoughts are, drop something down in the comments. Let's talk about it. Stuff to do, buttons and links, Patreon, I'll plug it again. That's down there. Plus other links to other things that I do or what have you. Check them out. Click on them. They do places. There's merch, all sorts of stuff. But also you don't have to because at the end of the day, you're the council. I'm just running the meetings. And until next time, this council is adjourned.